Chad Rogers is the founding partner of Crestview Strategy, one of the top lobbying and government relations firms in Canada. He is also recognized as one of Canada's top 100 lobbyists and is a regular commentator about politics and government on several Canadian news channels. Hi, I'm Vasi. And I'm Awesome. And this is the future of lobbying. Lobbying always generates polarizing opinions. It's largely unknown and there's a common misconception that it's a tool used by large and rich companies to influence the government. So what is lobbying? Lobbying, in definition, is an act of attempting to influence policies and decisions of officials, organizations, and governments. And this goes beyond just large corporations. Interest groups, activist groups, aid agencies, all play a major role in advocating their voices to concerned parties. So why did we choose this topic? For starters, we believe lobbying is an important part of participatory democracy. And today we discuss what lobbying is, what's the current state, and what does the future look like for lobbying? And will it continue to play as large a role in society as it does today? So thanks, Chad. Um, I guess to start off, The biggest thing we probably want to know is what exactly is lobbying? Well, the the original term lobbying comes from people who sat in the lobby of the Hay Adams Hotel trying to influence the U.S. president uh, as he walked through to and from uh, meals coming from the White House. So the, the original term refers to that transactional notion of trying to get access to politicians uh, or powerful people and get them to do something you want or to stop them from doing something that's going to hurt you. So lobbying is is really usually the, the, the narrow description of government relationships so the, the work people do to have a conversation with government in a really organized way, usually to try and get them to do something that's of advantage to them or to not do something that's of disadvantage to them. Lobbying and uh, is the colloquialism for that one part, government relations, but government relations really is the tip of the iceberg above the water you can see. The nine-tenths underneath are a broader industry or category we tend to call public affairs. And public affairs involves strategic communications, public opinion research, um, other types of uh, influence uh, or influencer work, and then doing things like campaigning, things that we'd recognize from elections we participated in, but done on the on the part of trade associations or interest groups or, or companies. So public affairs, the big category, government relations, the activity, lobbying, the easy language and the easy name we often give it. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, so, I mean, generally, if you ask uh, an average person, lobbying carries a bit of a negative perception. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, well, I, I don't take as the opening assumption that lobbying has a negative connotation because I've not run into many people who've not worked in government or public affairs who have any idea what the word means. Uh, I think it it you know it's a colloquialism. It doesn't sound like a profession when you just restrict it to that one label. At the end of the day, influence feels like a scary business uh, when you have never been exposed to it. So when you look at what marketers or PR people or advertisers or data scientists or anyone who broadly works in a community to try and organize or affect public opinion, that seems like a pretty scary manipulation when you're not familiar with it. The flip side is it's the organized part of democracy. Uh, When people as a group of 35 million want to get something done, they have to winnow it down to a, a, a more interested and committed group of 100,000 and then of that uh, a more active group of 1,000 who will actually do something to communicate with that less than 5,000 folks in senior public service and elected roles at any given time that control the fate of one issue. So I I, I think there's an easy cynical play where we can say, ah, oh, the population's 
you know, uh, sorry, the, the profession is not that, that popular amongst the, the, the population. But so too, you know, so many professions. We live in a cynical time where we're allowed to have negative opinions of everything we don't understand. And, and it, it really does fall into something we deal with in terms of public opinion, which is anything that has complexity attached to it in the age we live in is subject to an attack. Because if you're not party to that complexity, if you've done none of the hard work to become an expert in that issue, the easiest thing to say is that complexity hides something that I can't control or something that's going to work against me. Yeah. Um, so if someone came up to you and said, uh, what is the day in the life of a lobbyist? Like, what is it you do that you could explain to people that you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I tell my mother that I'm a mercenary for freedom. So uh, people can hire me and I try and uh, get more freedom. I try and uh, help companies and industry associations get uh, a greater ability to create jobs and invest in things. We try and help uh, companies that employ lots of people continue to employ lots of people. We try and help people build or grow the economy. And you know, there's lots of people who don't think that's the best idea. Um, there are lots of people out there who think that um, you know, it's much better to use a public dollar than a private dollar wherever you can, and it's much better if everybody waits in line for a crappy service as opposed to uh, people being able to make choices. And in Canada, we're wildly comfortable with the choice that we should get in the back of a very long line uh, to wait for something that ultimately no one wants because that's the fairest play. And that's not really how we organize ourselves most times when we reduce it to what we want personally. But for some reason in our Canadian public discussion, we often accept that. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like we've got, um, you know, as of 2018, we know in Canada there are over 9,000 lobbyists that are registered that do work over the course of the year to lobby, you know, the federal government. Um, you know, doing some research, we know that that process is very open and transparent. So you have to actually register to do the lobbying. Some of the rules are very strict. Um, you have to do it at the federal, provincial, municipal levels. Um, and basically you can look up anybody who's lobbying. So if I'm, you know, trying to figure out you, Chad Rogers, founding partner of Crestview Strategy, I essentially know who you're lobbying for. Um, so do you feel like that's enough of an open, transparent system in terms of the way that we know that, that lobbying and that sort of transactional nature of a business? Well, we, we have these new transparent things we call lobbying registries. We have, we, we have evolving and expanding rules at all three levels of government in Canada on the issues of ethics and integrity and the issue around um, organized paid influence lobbying. And the standard is going to keep getting higher on how much you have to make public. So look in this federal election, uh, the degree to which people who do digital advertising have to disclose. Now remember, when I do digital advertising, it's automated, so I may put 15,000 different versions of one little tiny Facebook ad into the market because that's what the technology allows me to do. I now have to declare all those and attach. So there, so there are new challenges. Google isn't taking any advertising for politics during this federal election because they said the compliance requirement was too high. So we're, we're, we're moving the bar upwards. Why, why is the bar going up and we're going to have more transparency, not less? And some people will complain about that. It's because anything that touches the public square is sacred. So if you're going to have money, so if a company comes to, to a, a company like ours at Crestview Strategy or a charitable cause or a trade association and says, we want you to help us to teach government about our issue or to help us convince them that what we want is the right idea. The public has every right to know if someone's paying to enter the public square. And if someone is building a movement or an organization or demanding the time of office holders. So the real test of all of these registries, and the, the, the rules are wildly different from one municipality to one province to the federal government. Some are really strong, some are embarrassingly weak. If someone pays to enter the debate, they should have to say, by the way, I paid to be here. And let people use that as one of the lenses on testing the quality of their arguments. And what you'll discover is, is in 2009, when the Federal Accountability Act passed and it was the real watershed moment of expanding transparency in this space, everyone thought, oh my God, no one, everyone's going to hate us now. The transparency is going to mean doors are closed. No one's going to want, and no, the, the amount of public affairs work has expanded because it works. Um, we, we worked um, with two municipalities, a piece of work we're super, super proud of. 
and they were the, the municipal corporations of Inuvik and Toktoyoktuk, who needed a highway between the two communities. Now, we jokingly call it the highway from nowhere to nowhere, which isn't very respectful uh, to the people of Inuvik or Toktoyoktuk, <laughs> but it makes the point that we're talking about a pretty unconventional piece of uh, public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They had a terrible time making this, guy, this argument in Ottawa because it seemed like such a low priority future thing to do. In fact, when, when we did a strategy session with them, when we ranked the who wants this road more than anyone, the number one constituency that wanted the road were the people at the Department of National Defense, because trans transportation infrastructure is what helps them do their job of protecting Arctic sovereignty and all the things they've got to do in the North. Well, that changed our lobbying strategy top to bottom, because finance and the Prime Minister's office in a budget weren't aware that there was demand from elsewhere in the federal government. This wasn't just an infrastructure project. Um, the, the supply chain was massively indigenously owned and indigenously staffed, so we helped make the point this isn't just just another highway you're building. It's a massive moment of economic independence for folks who live and base their lives in the north, and which technically, you know, other parts of government say that's a policy priority is supporting folks who live there. So the, 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 the simplest version is you have to figure out how to tell the right story to the right people to get meaning because no one in public life has a surplus of time or a surplus of attention because the folks at the top level of the public service and the top level of politics only spend their time making the worst best decision. And what I mean by that is all the easy decisions are made at lower levels of government mm -hmm. or made by people who are way lower down uh, on the food uh, chain. Um, the folks who are cabinet ministers or deputy ministers or leaders of the public service or, or elected life, they only get the tough decisions to make. So they get five options and none of them are a clear win. They're all imperfect and they have to take the heat for choosing the best of the worst. Uh, so the more that you can edit decisions, the more that you can help make a case that fits with the narrow space they're going to have and the narrow amount of attention they're going to have uh, to make decisions, that's, that's a lot of where we plug in. And if money's involved or a corporate interest is involved, why not be transparent about it? Because um, a little bit of sunshine will mean anyone who's ashamed to be involved in the debate uh, hopefully will never raise their head. Uh, the folks we work with aren't ashamed to, of their employees or the products they make or the services they offer to the investment they want to make in Canada. Well, wonderful. Uh, so it, it's interesting you've touched on uh, the bar you know, being raised uh, uh, consistently. Besides uh, the regulatory oversight, what other changes have you seen over the last 10-15 years? Well, we had, a, we had a few big changes in Canada. One is we ended political contributions. So some of this work broadly in government relations used to be attached to coordinating political contributions. You, company X, need to donate to the following 20 people, you know, to the max amount. So thankfully, we removed all the campaign contribution stuff out in almost every political market in the country. So corporations and unions and trade associations really can't make large donations like they used to, and companies can't be involved in directing that and saying influence should be attached to, uh, to political contribution. That's a healthy thing to retire that. Now, we never had that much money in Canada like you see in other markets where the money itself becomes troubling because we've always had really strong caps. So in Canada, you know, even though the old system I think it's better that we've abandoned it. It wasn't a lot of money. Nobody was getting rich. There was no, uh, mm -hmm. there, there was no great scandal embedded in it more often than not. Um, so number one, campaign contributions are gone. Number two, the ethics and integrity and, and transparency requirements on office holders and public servants is climbing as well. So they've got to declare, do you, or have you accepted a gift? Uh, what do you and your family have to declare in your annual disclosures? What do you, so there are many fewer um, uh, avenues for people who want to behave inappropriately, either on the giving side or the receiving side, with a lot more uh, watching it. And then thirdly, our elections are getting uh, stronger. And, and in Canada, you know, citizens often forget that we have a system where every dollar is audited, uh, and you can't take your seat in Parliament or a provincial assembly until the elections authority said you passed, that you didn't do anything crazy or you didn't spend too much money or do anything gross. You know, you look for um, the hallmark of Canada, unlike anywhere else, is every time you see an election brochure or sign, look in the bottom corner and look for authorized by official agent of. That, that's actually an audit standard to make sure the elections authority can point to every dollar they see being spent and connect it back to the file when it comes in. So we, we have we have really strong rules, we have a culture of compliance and we're making it stronger every year. And 
I often get a call from, there's a couple of newspapers that cover the world of lobbying and, and Parliament Hill. There, there's the Hill Times, there's iPolitics, there's the Lobby, Lobby Monitor. Monitor. Yeah. Few, few of yeah. these kind of bespoke publications that only a thousand of us read. And every time there's a change in the rules, I get the classic call where someone says, lobbyists are mad uh, about the new rules being too cumbersome. What do you think? And I'm like, bring on the rules. Uh, more rules is only going to raise the bar and it's going to drive out of business the lower quality, less compliance minded actors uh, and mean that everybody who's playing by the rules is going to do better in the business. And a lot, you know, transparency's never lost us a piece of business or hurt one of our clients. Yeah, and I was, I was actually going to go back to that. So you think that sort of transparency and oversight will be a future trend, that we'll see that more and more um, in the context of lobbying? And, and do you think it'll be more like a tightening of rules or a different level of transparency? Maybe we're already yeah, if we're, seeing a bit of that if already? we're talking about future state, um, one of the things is that the, the degree to which decent technology systems that have low costs to maintain create more opportunities for public transparency and public record keeping. So take blockchain and take um, that there becomes a blockchain ledger for the public lobbying registry. Much more searchable, um, a much uh, more trusted by the public consumers of it that it can't be manipulated much. So the, the more and more, you know, you look at the lobbying registry, we could have had the same lobbying registry 50 years ago, you just would have had to fly to Ottawa and flip through a book that someone would have had to print. Um, so the, the technology is always on the side of transparency. Um, and, I, and I think that, that uh, you look at what they're trying to do on the election advertising and saying, because of what happened in the US in the last federal election, all digital advertising needs to be searchable. So now you can go and search who's targeting you on Facebook or Twitter uh, or any other uh, content network. You can search for which advertising uh, each interest paid for. And, and the technology is just catching up with the demand um, to be able to know these things. But we always live in two separate places. So we work with a company I won't identify out of, out of respect to uh, our client's confidentiality, but let's just say they make a beloved Canadian, uh, a, a product beloved by Canadians that is a sparkling beverage uh, that refreshes you, uh, when you when you want refreshment. Um, there's two sides to when we talk about things like um, uh, sugar sweetened beverages. People will say, ah, oh, they're terrible, I hate them, we should regulate them out of existence, and then you bring one out of your briefcase and go, Oh, I love that product. Uh, let me tell you three stories about how this is my brand and this is my product and this is my life. So when we're in the public space, we often have to be conscious that the cynicism and the commentary and the what's a negative is often divorced from the individual choices we make as consumers. And I call this the diet and exercise conundrum. Everyone, when asked in their annual physical, overestimates how good their diet is and how much they exercise because they know that's the one solution to being healthier. Uh, but it's not always related to the consumer choices they make every hour of the day. Okay. So uh, I'm glad you brought up the, the blockchain example. So how has the, the evolution of technology, like more specifically big data, uh, impacted uh, your work? Um, well, there's a lot of lobbying in it. Um, look at a really interesting file like uh, that. We had no um, lobbying record on it around the private members bill around genetic privacy uh, about a year and a half ago where certain ethnocultural communities that have a higher genetic likelihood of disease wanted an absolute ban on um, commercially available genetic data uh, to be available to insurance companies so that they couldn't be blocked from uh, life insurance in future because they were part of a group that had a higher genetic likelihood of things like uh, metastasizing cancers. So very passionate debate, very, very complicated. And the private members bill said, well, uh, all insurance companies should be banned from touching genetic data ever in all circumstances. And that sounds like a pretty reasonable position because you don't want Ashkenazi Jews in Canada who have a predilection to a bucket of diseases most people don't to be punished in the long term. The flip side of it is I consent to get a physical when I go for life insurance because I want to buy the product and I want the product to be calibrated to my real risk, which often gets the price lower, not higher. Genetic data is going to be part of that in future. Mm. So in the first wave of how we're responding to this uh, notion of uh, available big data, and I'm saying genomics being a, a great uh, example of that, we're maybe reacting passionately with blunt force before we know how the product will interact in the market. Um, so for our public affairs business, what does it mean? It means a lot of what we do is more digital than it used to be. 
I don't uh, just commission a poll anymore. I use Crimson Hexagon and go in and look at the five years of discussion on any subject and see how organic debates have devolved amongst informed and uninformed people. Um, you know, there are these giant troves of real, uh, crudely we'd call them crowdsourced uh, data sets of how people have actually behaved. There are more and more public data sets coming online from governments about who parks where and where potholes are and how dollars are spent or um, how power or water moves about our municipalities. That's all useful for people to come forward with better proposals about uh, how to do things. And for us, that's all new business. I mean, a, a third of our business right now, uh, of the hundred or so clients that trust us at, at Crestview Strategy, would be companies that didn't exist or run businesses that didn't exist 10 years ago. So uh, ride sharing and home sharing and uh, content delivery and you have fundamental economies being flipped upside down in one generation and our society people aren't running in the streets my mother who lives on PEI is consuming most of these products and it isn't shocking it isn't uh, displacing anyone so the, the what you'll often find is there are more constructive solutions that uh, all these new economy things bring that the consumer uh, brain is willing to accept right away because it makes their life easier. But yeah, they're scary. They're scary because it's change and we always want to take the most alarming view that robots are going to control us all and none of us are going to have jobs. But you know, the, the dystopian stuff's often you know, more for entertainment than it is for information. And in the context of uh, this idea of big data, you know, having these big data sets and, and using it, like, do you foresee that fundamentally shifting the way traditional lobbying is being done? So your traditional lobbying is like, you know, you and I will go in, we'll ask for a face-to-face -face meeting, we'll sit down, we'll have a chat, maybe we'll, I don't know, there, you prepare a document, whatever it is to sort of make the case, however you position it. Um, how do you think this idea of having exponentially more data set points available to you as opposed to, you know, five, ten years ago it was kind of like, hey, I want to talk to uh, X person. Well, I think it gets you over the anecdotal when you're making your business case to uh, the public sector or a regulator or to say, I've looked at a data set and here's a data set that proves what I'm saying is true. People are paying too much, uh, a regulatory process is taking too long, and here's the cost to society. And if you make this change, here's the benefit we can deliver, and here it's proved out. So we don't need to commission 10 more studies, your own data set spells this out. Uh, or even little things, um, you know, with some of our bigger clients that have a national footprint across the country, we use Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, and just plot where all the offices and all the jobs are. Uh, so that when you go in and talk to someone, for a lot of people at the federal level, geography is really important. Do you touch my province? Do you touch my region? Are you making an investment in jobs or, or the local community? Or do you have a supply chain that you feed into? You know, that previous company I mentioned that makes a, a sparkling beverage, uh, they pay for an awful lot of corn and an awful lot of beets uh, across the country. It's really important when you're going in and making an argument to explain all the people whose livelihoods are derived uh, directly from the sale of your product uh, that people enjoy. Uh, so, you know, data, data helps there. I, I think the next phase, you know, we, we do a lot of work that we call mobilization. And mobilization is really government relations by other means. Uh, government relations being a very direct, the client or the client's proxy dealing with the public service or the elected class uh, directly. Mobilization is where do we find the 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 passionate people who are employees or lovers or consumers of that space who will go make the argument individually to say, by the way, Vassie, I'm one of your voters and I really, really yeah. care about this and if you touch this adversely, my husband's going to lose their job or um, my partner uh, is going to lose uh, all the business um, uh, that feeds our family or um, this is going to have an adverse effect on our community in the following way and I'm telling you that as your um, citizen voter who you feel accountable to so it's not always the person in the good suit uh, that marches in and gives the high order of magnitude uh, and the policy case you've also got quote-unquote real people saying this has consequences I mean everything that you speak to government about government doesn't wake up every day looking to do bad things they, they wake up every day looking to do two things. How can we make life a little bit better? And how do we cope with all the crappy decisions we have to make today because we're the government? Uh, so when you show up and you say, here's something that could make life better, or here's something that helps you avoid one of the really crappy decisions you've got to make, you usually have a willing partner in government because they don't get to ever press stop. The merry-go-round is going to keep going around where they have to try and do those two things every day. Mm -hmm. um, so. 
In terms of, you know, in a lot of industries, they talk about the great disruption, right? So, you know, Uber disrupted the way we sort of use cars, you know, Google disrupted the way we looked up sort of data and information, uh, Facebook in terms of how we connect online. Do you foresee any sort of great disruption when it comes to the idea of lobbying? Or do you think it's where those, that the data sets are, is that what that's really going to maybe change the face of lobbying as we know it? There's three or four disruptions we're going through. Um, so all of the new regulatory lenses we have to see our work through. Lobbying used to be the domain of powerful, well-networked people who came from an elite community and who leveraged their brokerage power within that elite to get things done or to solve problems. That's 50 years ago, 30 years ago, to some extent 20 years ago. So you hired a lobbyist based on their Rolodex. You hired them because they were once the fixer for a prime minister or uh, they had that, that pedigree. The public affairs business, if you went office to office to the best firms who have the best clients, that's not who's running the files anymore. The people the, the, who's running the files are the best and the brightest and the smartest who can make that case uh, and, and make that case in the most efficient way. So we're having a big disruption in labor where our industry used to be overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, and overwhelmingly from a power class. So privilege was the tool they got to use. That's not what you're seeing now when you walk into a public affairs firm. Um, you're seeing uh, smart folks. You know, we, we employ three data analysts here. We didn't have that position uh, on our org chart five years ago. Um, and, and those are not traditional call central casting for a uh, person from the back room. So there's a labor disruption of the type of talent that does this business. There's an evolution to do more of that mobilization work, more of get people who are out there in the public who want that thing or don't want that thing to tell the story themselves. And technology allows you to find it. You, you can build a, a diverse coalition across Canada of about 500 people who are passionate about anything uh, because our country's so big. The challenge is finding 500 people who agree uh, in a country as big as Canada is a really tough thing, except technology now makes that realistic. Um, you know, I, I got to work in the uh, LGBTQ advocacy space at a time when um, organizing in that space was hard because outside of the major cities it was there, there weren't established interest groups or there weren't uh, established places of coming together in the public square. Digitally, it's very, very easy to find folks now based on a community of interest, even if they're geographically really dispersed, uh, where they can communicate with each other, they can organize together, they can um, create some scale of their activity in advocacy. That used to be harder because you used to have to have people in one place where they were already meeting or already organized. So there's that mobilization function um, is a big disruption. And then the, the third would be as our economy in Canada hollows out and we become a country that doesn't have headquarters anymore, uh, that is a branch plant uh, of most global brands, that is losing a lot of its intellectual capital in most categories, that is no longer leading a single economic category. So with with the recent movement in the gold business, um, Barrick Gold was the last global champion headquartered in Canada that was the top of a, of a category. Um, so what, what we see in Canada is a bit of a disconcerting, a disconcerting brain, game, a brain drain so that we are now a market often fighting for just a Canada share, not Canada leading. Uh, that's, a, that's deeply concerning. Um, you know, fewer headquarters, fewer of the senior most decision makers resident in our economy. Why is that disconcerting? Well, I mean, the conceit of what we want Canada to be, but also because Canada as a market is pretty unusual compared to most of our Western colleagues, um, uh, or colleagues in the Western world, because we're just so big. Uh, and other than the folks in five cities, we live in pretty, uh, low population density and we have a really high expectation of services so yeah there's a bunch of disruptions there but you know we've done a lot of work in the content space the cannabis space the sharing space and the thing I always discipline us to when we start our strategy sessions is remember all the advice we gave to our clients seven years ago was wrong and when we told them how Canada wasn't going to be willing to change or bend to these markets very quickly because the regulators were in charge and Canadians wouldn't do anything new or risky, we were completely wrong. And the Canadian markets moved way faster on adoption, on demand for government to modernize rules than we've ever seen in any other category. Uh, so, so we've got to learn some new tricks. We've got to get a lot better about talking to people as consumers, not just talking to the elite groups that think they're leading national opinion. Yeah. So can I, yeah, that, that's an interesting point you make. I want to maybe uh, talk a bit about that. So maybe part of the disruption you're saying comes from more of a willingness to 
push on these issues and that the government is maybe more open towards certain industries that are more disruptive than you anticipate. Uh, but I like that point you made about how the advice you gave seven years ago was not, a, not that it was accurate, but it was, you didn't think that maybe... I'm never going to base a public affairs strategy in the courage and vision of the Canadian government uh, at any level of government because we don't wire our system to be racing ahead of the public. Um, what I will say is that baby boomers as they've aged have taught everyone else the trick they knew, which is that if you're the biggest group, the minute you demand something because it's convenient to you, everyone bends to your needs. Um, Netflix is completely contrary to every design we have of Canadian culture policy. But Canadians like Netflix and every party has a, a screaming reaction, we won't tax Netflix uh, in the last two federal elections, if not three. Why? Because the consumer penetration of it's so high and it's so convenient that our consumer view has smashed all of our elite consensus about how we manage content policies. So there's no commentary embedded in that on how Netflix does business or other culture players and we act for all kinds of players who aren't Netflix who pay way more than their fair share when Netflix doesn't. Um, what, what I would say is it's an example of Canadian policymakers are terrified about how weak their relationship with their citizens is. Because as traditional media has declined and as life's gotten more complicated, if I'm an elected official or a senior public servant, I'm terrified that people aren't as predictable or in as easily organized or accessed a group as they used to be. I can't go to the Canadian press gallery, sit there and give a press conference and know that everyone heard what I said. People are really, really busy, really, really independent, leading really interesting lives where they curate all their information and they may not hear or care what Canada's leaders say. So one of the things they're doing is trying to attach themselves to consumer issues where they know they can get uh, the attention of the normal person, the citizen or voter. Um, look at how Stephen Harper uh, regulated Canada's cable bills uh, to make cable bills. Did he do that because he was passionately worried about oligopolic behavior in the cable space? No, he knew it because it was something most people cared about and it was the only way he could get ordinary people's attention to show that he was on the side of consumers. So we're gonna see way more of that going forward mm. and it's why when an Uber, look at the tension of Uber. Uber's a, a pretty big actor in terms of how quickly they've been willing to disrupt the uh, market and how aggressively they've been willing to behave. And, um, you know, we represent another actor in that space, Lyft, the friendlier ride, highly recommended. Every ride's carbon neutral. Um, <laughs> but, but Uber comes in as the category smasher, category definer. And ultimately, most levels of government just caved. They didn't respond and create ride-sharing policy that was in response to what Canada was going to need. They said, customers love Uber so much we can't get rid of it. It's already here and now we can't walk it back. So we'll negotiate a settlement that leaves consumers access to the product. And outside of British Columbia, that's basically been the story. Um, and, and is the story there that one company behaved badly or um, governments were too slow? No, it's that the speed at which consumers will adopt something new if it fits within their lives and then demand that it be protected forever is something we didn't used to have. You couldn't introduce a product that quickly. Look at cannabis where um, you know the product and the category has developed so fast whole new social permissions, whole new, none of us would have ever believed in sleepy slow Canada that we'd be this far ahead in a legalized market penetration in this period of time. It wouldn't have been 10 years ago, the smartest public affairs people would have said that's a fantasy, it could never happen. And it still feels like we're going too slow. So, that, so that's where lobbying really has to stay up to date in terms of all of these types of disruptions, because it's, it's then impacting the way you know, you or your firm go in and engage and mobilize and For, for us, we have to be way more courageous in the advice we give. Uh, to not say, here is the most likely predictable uh, way Canadian regulators and decision makers have behaved before. We've got to actually game through a couple of crazy options. Uh, one of my favorite movies is The Hunt for Red October. Uh, and, and, and there is this moment in the film uh, that I'd encourage people to look up called The Crazy Ivan, uh, which is he's going to turn <laughs> left or right uh, precipitously in the submarine. We now have to put a crazy Ivan into the first version of every planning process, which is, what if we just did something that otherwise would seem nuts? to our conventional view of this. Um, you've got to do it. Why? Because consumers are powerful, they are selfish, they demand convenience, they demand things that fit with their really, really busy lives. And why? 
because we actually have a functioning democracy now where the meritocracy gets to demand what they want and the working middle class gets to demand what they want, not just the curated view of how elites believe our society should run. And that gives rise to things that we're now calling populism and we're really uncomfortable with. But what is populism other than all the people who weren't a member of the elite having a say, which has supposedly been the pursuit of our democracy for 150 years, was to invite all the smelly people with dumb opinions to have an equal agency to all the fancy people who think they have expert opinions and for the two of them to sit next to each other as equals. It's kind of what we've been supposed to be working on, but the people who've always been in charge are really uncomfortable at uninformed opinion arriving at the table and demanding yeah. an equal say. Okay. So, so let me just follow up on that because when you mentioned uh, Stephen Harper regulating the cable bill, for example, and I think there's been some conversation in this election. Uh, I think the Prime Minister talked about regulating the cell phone bills and things like that. Because of all of this, do you feel that there's a risk of either over-regulation or with disruptive technologies like Uber not being prepared enough and there's no regulation? Like, How do you balance that? I can't find a single part of the Canadian economy where under-regulation would be our challenge. Um, we, we do kind of have a default view that um, because we're such a big, wide, undeveloped country, that we need to trust government to put the guardrails up on almost every part of our economy. And then in some cases we really overregulate and we say, well, the country is so big, the only way ever we can guarantee that everybody has equal service in northern Saskatchewan and downtown Toronto is we'll regulate an oligopoly. And we'll say only a few players can, so that we can have some certainty that we can demand a national value uh, uh, equation uh, out of this market. That thinking just doesn't work uh, the more you go forward because we know that the cost of regulating a market and perverting um, its input costs uh, against what you can make means you reduce the amount of investment. The minute you reduce the amount of investment, you reduce the speed of innovation and the degree to which you can offer compelling new products. So in Canada, a country where very few of us live in dead cities, but the very few of us happen to be half the national population, um, we have this big divide which is can the part of Canada that doesn't live in a dense population that's easier to serve and sell things to um, keep the same expectation of quality of life and availability of services as the uh, as the other half who live in uh, a range of medium to very very tiny communities further and further and further away from the US border um, so I come from PEI right I come from a small place and the only reason I had great public schools growing up and I mean great public schools and good hospitals was because we had equalization and because the rest of Canada chose to throw money in a bucket and we all decided to say we should, we should, we should have roughly the same access to services. That thinking as we apply it to private markets is going to get harder and harder and harder. Now the, the big three forces that changed our lives in our lifetimes, and we're all of course very, very young still, but I'm, you know, we're probably also technically past the marker of middle age. You know, things that affected our lives that we don't want to admit are um, high, the availability of high-speed internet and containerized shipping. Uh, because when we were kids, everyone couldn't buy the same things cheaply. Uh, so in PEI, uh, school clothes time, everybody had the exact same clothes from the Towers department store. So we didn't have 10 fancy brands like the kids in bigger cities. <laughs> That's not true anymore, right? Uh, containerized shipping and the internet have changed the availability of goods that everyone can access. So there may be ways that this urban world divide or big, small in terms of cost of service markets um, that we can just innovate past it. Um, but that, that's where I see the bigger tension going forward uh, in a country like ours. It's not the amount of regulation, it's how do you make sure that you don't uh, make the, the availability of things um, in urban areas so wildly different and superior than uh, non-urban areas. Uh, because then that just compounds urbanization. You know, we're sitting right now in downtown Toronto, uh, in the core of the city. Toronto welcomes 135,000 new new people every year, mm -hmm. and we have to have a place for them to live. Uh, so we live in a city that's a big service economy that's still a magnet. It's not as easy to live in a community that's having the reverse challenge. Absolutely. So let's change tack a little bit and uh, like talk about the dynamic of lobby, right? Uh, so you earlier mentioned about. Uh, the highway project that you work with, the, a couple of indigenous communities. What's the role of uh, lobbying in working with uh, advocacy firms or aid agencies and you know on social issues? And what are some of the challenges that you may Um So I, I sit on the board of a number of uh, not-for-profits and uh, non-governmental organizations. We have clients, uh, paying clients, that sit 
equal and next to those publicly traded corporations who are themselves social interests. You know, Crestview's very, very proud to have as a client Breakfast Clubs of Canada, where, um, you know, we are paid to help them with their advocacy plan to make sure that more kids actually get the nutrition they need to start their day uh, in a class neutral and, and highly efficacious way, because that's one of the big predictors of the success they're going to have in life, is if they've got enough nutrition to learn uh, while they're in public schools. Um, how is it different? It's not. You have to make the best case and you have to slip into that stream of a very busy, overly preoccupied public decision maker, either elected or senior public service, to say, we need this much money or this much permission or this much attention from you. And the public versus the private cases, there's not a big difference. It's you're competing for very little attention and very scarce resources when you're sitting in front of a minister or a member or a deputy. Um, so how is it different for us? Well, you know, we usually, we try and do lots of pro bono for the organizations that wouldn't have the resources to speak for themselves. You know, we work with charities like Journals for Human Rights, True Patriot Love, which helps Canada's military families action against hunger, a global charity that feeds children and moms and helps them avoid the, the, the critical damage of, of food insecurity, which could result in malnutrition or, or death. Um, you know, we just help them make the case better. Um, because the the... The question in government, you know, if we split our business into two big functions, for our private sector clients, they are more often than not interested in the mitigation of risk. So can you identify those things that are going to create a business interruption or going to create a risk to us being able to invest or sell services or products to our customers or participate in the Canadian economy extracting value? On the broader industry association side, so when people aren't individual companies anymore, they're associations, they're trades, they're categories, um, or, or not-for-profits and non-governmentals, they often want a surface opportunity. Where can government help us get further ahead? Where can government invest or partner or create a space for us? You know, we, we have a client right now who all they want is to be able to get access before private companies to decommissioned public buildings. So when an elementary school is no longer an elementary school, can we get in to try and convert it to public use before we convert it to private use? So instead of a condo tower, can we prioritize that maybe the people that want to make it a mixed-use seniors home get a first kick at the can? Even if they can't pay as much, uh, it'll have a greater community. So it's, it's just making the case. And the, the, the individual companies, public or private, tend to be more focused on the risk piece. Um, trade associations, categories, non-for-profits, non-governmentals tend to be more focused on the opportunity side. Um, so, where do you see sort of the, the future state of lobbying then? Do you think that with all of this oversight, with all of this sort of massive kind of disruptive uh, transformation, um, that at some point, you know, society will reach out and be like, yeah, lobbying, that makes sense, or not so much a, a positive sort of perception of it, but they will maybe understand the intrinsic value of it or what lobbying is. Do you think we'll ever get to that point? Well, I, I don't know that we need to. I think there will only ever be a small uh, percentage of people in our society who um, end up in the public affairs industry um, because it's a pretty niche business. Um, we're not suddenly going to have uh, hundreds of thousands of, of folks in this business, I don't think, um, number one. Uh, number two, I think the the push forward is really focused on how does the public have a relationship with its government. So look at the new um, burden of duty to consult. So the court saying if you want to build a pipeline or a big energy extraction project or you want to do something, you have a much bigger duty than you've ever had not to just get permission from the government but to prove you got permission from the people who live in that area or have a traditional claim or stake to it. So there's going to be a bit of an expansion because that, that organizing of public groups and public opinion is, is more and more important as we have more democracy and more transparency. Um, but going forward, what, what do we need to do to future-proof our business? We invest in a lot more code than we used to. You know, I, I don't know that you'd think of uh, a public affairs agency being a big programming function. We have three or four products right now in development and two that are in operation for our clients that are entirely uh, machine learning driven in how we offer a better version of service than just more bodies at more desks. Um, that's new. Uh, taking advantage of both that public data and you know better um, um, a better quality of decision making that gets us out of the anecdotal in making our cases and gets us um, uh, making it um, with with more absolute and objective fact. Uh, our workforce, uh, you know, when we go out to the workforce to hire, we get a lot of applications, 
and we've had to learn to be much more diverse and tolerant in the kind of experience we ask for because we need to have a richer reflection in our professionals of what the electeds and senior public servants increasingly look like. And this was an industry dominated by one type of person for a long, long time. And what we've learned is that you can't just be more uh, open-minded in your hiring. You have to go out and explain your business and be a magnet for all kinds of people who say, that wouldn't be for me, I'd never be invited into that club. So we really have to work for diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences, diverse uh, CVs. Um, to get way different talent that's got a wider bucket of skills and a wider view of what the country looks like. You know, what, what, what is the second most spoken language in the city of Toronto right now? Mandarin? Spanish. Span oh, okay. Uh, what language, uh, what, what is the two, uh, if you combine uh, the two of them, what is the highest circulation newspaper in Canada? Uh, it's a Chinese language daily. Okay. Uh, or? Correct. Oh, oh hey. Yeah, wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> Two points, same game. Yeah. Um, so we live in a country where when you, you have privileged blinders on, you don't quite understand it's changing way faster mm -hmm. uh, than, than folks in power sometimes price it. So if you want to be someone who's organizing Canadians, understanding what Canadians feel, and getting ahead so that your clients aren't surprised by where public opinion is moving, you have to have a different version of Canada that isn't the people who were in the parliamentary, you know, interns program in 1990, who all had roughly the same, you know, skin tone and were biased towards one gender. Um, you know, you've got to look a lot more like the country, and you know that that's hard. That's an input cost that you you've got to get ahead of when you're a services business. It's really really hard to hire talent. The the war in a services business is always for the best talent. Toronto's a really hot market where we have a lot of our professionals. So, you know, it's it's I mean. All of that is the classic corporate whining to say you got to work harder and uh, you, you've got to figure out what you, the next version of your offering is. Well, I think that was a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much, Chad. But before we let you go, uh, one thing I think I want to start a bit of a tradition is we'll ask every guest if there's one movie or movie that they recommend or a book that you recommend uh, that we read. Uh, well, for movie, and it's not representative of our business, but it is the most entertaining screenplay about um, influence. It is a Wag the Dog, uh, which is a movie they shot in 30 days uh, back in the 90s, and people forget it, starring Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro as a team around a U.S. president who's in decline, who decide they're going to start a fake war with Albania uh, and distract <laughs> the American people. I actually, pretending. I think I've seen that movie. And yes. it, is, it is hysterically funny. It's completely untrue. It could never happen, but it is a good uh, the other is Chris Buckley's uh, book, uh, Thank You for Smoking, uh, which again is a farce and a parody, and that's not actually how we live our lives, but it's a it's a good satire on what uh, the business of influence is. And for a book, uh, a book that's changed my heart and my worldview dramatically is uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' uh, Between the World and Me. Um, it's a short book. Um, it's someone of our generation, our age, who tells a story that... Um, you know, it, as you read it, you will understand if you self-select into understanding his experience or end up like me being shocked that you didn't understand that experience. But um, that's uh, that's the one I, I buy and put in people's uh, uh, stockings more often than not. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Thank Chad. you so much, Appreciate Chad. It. Thanks, guys. Thank you. If you enjoyed the episode, you can send us an email at futureof19 at gmail.com or you can also visit our website at www ftrof.com. Thank you for listening and have yourself a great day.